Last year, one of my watch goals for my collection, in case you missed it, was the Cartier Santos. Well, today I unbox one I scored off eBay for an absolute bargain. But before I get into that, I also want to share six reasons why I fell in love with the Santos and why you should consider this watch too. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. Today, I'm gonna to share my six reasons why I absolutely love the Cartier Santos. I'm also unboxing my first Cartier, so I'm extremely excited. Wristwatch check. Now, I'm wearing the 1962 Dan Henry. I'm waiting for the 1972. It's on its way back from being repaired, if you recall from the review. <laughs> Trying to fill the void with this uh, wonderful piece. And I'm gonna talk about this Fluco suede strap a little bit later on. This is the best uh, suede strap, and of course I bought it from Holbens. I've been a customer of theirs for uh, donkey's years, and I'll explain why uh, I'll get into the straps a little bit later on. Let's start off with a little bit of history to help contextualize. When it comes to luxury brands with heritage, few are as accomplished and varied in what they offer than Cartier. Their signature red little boxes litter my family members' homes, not just for watches, but bags, pens, clothing, accessories, and perhaps what they're most well known for. And that is, of course, one of the world's most prestigious jewelry makers. So obviously it's something of a family tradition and has been for generations. Founded in Paris by Louis-François Cartier in 1847, it is now a subsidiary of the Richemont Empire. But despite that, it still remains partly owned by Elie Pagels, the granddaughter of Pierre Cartier. The Cartier family's creations can be seen in museums all around the world and has been worn by an endless list of royals, celebrities, movie stars and so on. So much so that King Edward VII of Great Britain referred to Cartier as the jeweller of kings and the king of jewellers. So is it any wonder that Cartier basically invented the first luxury iconic watch? Uh, and most of it's down to my second point, which of course is its design. The Cartier Santos, or Santos Dumont, has one of the most intriguing stories behind its genesis that you simply could not make up. Cartier first developed it for the dapper Brazilian daredevil and socialite Alberto Santos Dumont, who was something of an aviation pioneer, as in 1901 he was the first to fly around the Eiffel Tower in a specially built airship he had designed himself. The controls in all his various aircrafts he flew were often so primitive that Santos Dumont asked his friend Louis Cartier to come up with something which would allow him not to have to take his hand off the joystick in order to check his pocket watch. Let's not forget, at the time, it was still the norm for gents to wear and tell time by pocket watch. By 1904, Louis Cartier had come up with a watch with a white dial featuring oversized numerals and an inner minute track designed to be easy and quick to read. The distinctive square bezel and overall shape was inspired by the burgeoning new machine age of the time, as well as various clocks that Cartier had previously produced. To reflect the jewelry heritage of Cartier and the debonair style of Santos Dumont, a blue sapphire cobblechon was placed in the crown, a gemstone chosen because in the medieval and ancient world, it signified celestial faith and hope. They are also believed to have properties of protection and good fortune, perfect for somebody in the early days of flight. These would become uh, kind of signature traits and part of Cartier's watch design language uh, to this very day. You can see it pretty much uh, elements of in, in all of their watches. Uh, but we must give credit to Patek, who a little while earlier did invent the first lady's wristwatch, but it was Santos Dumont who made it more acceptable uh, for men to wear wristwatches, because up until this point, it was actually seen as quite effeminate. You could say he was a, like a trendsetter or an influencer of his generation. In order to understand how innovative this was for the time, it would not be for another decade during World War I that wristwatches would really become a trend 
following the trench watches worn during the conflict, as pocket watches were simply not practical in combat. Therefore, pocket watches were converted by either having rudimentary lugs soldered or attached via specially constructed leather straps, thus allowing both hands free for combat. It was not until after the war in the 1920s and 30s that wristwatches became more commonplace for men. My third point is one of the most intriguing and equally fascinating is the variety, the different choices available, uh, not only in different models and different eras, but also in the types of people that wore them uh, over a century, which is astonishing to think. So let's take a look. This is mainly due to it evolving far more over the century compared to the relatively more consistent design language of the Cartier tank, which of course came a little later. There's a lot to cover here, so I'll keep it simple and break it down into five generations. The first Santos watches are often erroneously described as Art Deco by just about everyone. The original Santos was from the turn of the century and was actually inspired by the industrial machine age, which in a way was a progenitor to what would become Art Deco later in the 1920s and 30s. It's an easy mistake to make as Cartier would adopt the Art Deco style heavily and it still is a key part of its brand identity and design language. The biggest change would be with the second and third generations during the 1970s. With Gerald Genta revolutionizing the luxury watch world with his Adumont Piguet Royal Oak, Patek Nautilus and so on, Cartier updated the Santos to cash in. In 1978, Cartier redesigned and renamed the watch Santos de Cartier. Full steel versions, along with two-tone variations and integrated bracelets, were all introduced for the first time. This was in order to make this formerly dressy pilot's watch into something a little bit more sporty, but yet still inherently luxury. So by the 1980s, the quartz crisis had really started to take effect. So Cartier responded by uh, releasing their third generation renaming it again to the Santos Galbi. But this was an interesting period because it was mainly quartz based and also they did some pretty outlandish designs like the octagonal versions and of course the round versions and the first quartz uh, chronograph Santos as well. The watch was extensively redesigned, shedding its boxy looks, becoming slimmer and more curved around the lugs in order to be better fitting on the wrist than the original Santos. In the mid-2000s, Cartier created the fourth generation by going big and to keep up with the current oversized trend at the time. The Santos 100 was born and became available in XL, launched in 2004 to commemorate the 100-year anniversary, versions with more daring materials like the black ADLC, titanium models and a wider variety of complications became available. Chronographs, for example, that made good use of that extra space by going large. Most impressive of all was the skeletonized models that for the first time showed off Cartier's abilities as a true watchmaker with their very first completely in-house made 128 part manually wound 9611 MC caliber. Up until this point, Cartier had used mainly ETA and before that it was based on movements by Vachon Constantin, Adumar Piguet, Movado and Le Coultre. The final fifth and current contemporary generation debuted in 2018, with being more classically styled, as well as being available in the more traditional sizes of regular unisex and large, but by this time based on their first proprietary mechanical automatic movements, the Calibre 1847 MC. So to promote this new generation, Cartier utilised one of their brand ambassadors, Jake Gyllenhaal, amazingly um, talented actor, love his work. The advert, check it out if you missed it, really captures that spirit of adventure, the, the long, rich legacy of the first iconic watch in a poetic visual style that I just think is un capo lavoro, veramente, you should check it out. Um, but beyond that, I think watch advertising at the luxury level tends to be kind of pretentious, tends to be full of cliches. So yeah, it was wonderful. And actually that segues nicely into my fourth reason I love the Santos, and that is its cinematic and cultural impact. The Cartier tank will forever be their most famous watch. The choice of many royals, actors, artists, athletes, musicians, writers, you name it, the list is simply endless. The Santos, in comparison, has had more of a varied cultural impact and to some degree 
has been overshadowed by the more popular tank. One of the most memorable appearances of this watch was by the infamous, oleaginous and lovably loathsome Gordon Gecko, a character played excellently by Michael Douglas, who actually won an Academy Award for the role in the 1987 classic movie Wall Street. Directed by Oliver Stone, this uber 80s cautionary tale of stock market fraud coined the phrase greed, for lack of a better word, is good, as well as being a perfect bit of watch casting. Bought it 10 years ago for $60,000. I could sell it today for $600. The illusion has become real, and the more real it becomes, the more desperate they want it. Capitalism at its finest. Gordon Gecko's choice was the full gold Santos in what now seems a dated but typical unisex size of that era. The sporty yet classical style suited the character perfectly as he tries to mask his new money greedy vulgarity by choosing a brand more commonly associated with old world sophistication, aristocrats and the upper classes. So it's painfully obvious, as you can tell, I'm a massive cinema fan. What I love about the watch in uh, Wall Street, it captures that age. It doesn't bring you out of the movie. Uh, a prime example of terrible watch casting is the forced product placement in Terminator 3, that Royal Oak Offshore. I love the nuance, the way that Charlie Sheen starts off with a quartz affordable watch and then gets a Santos later on uh, as he becomes more successful. It's done subtly and that's so important. It's part of the costume, it's part of the fabric of the movie. Perhaps the most fascinating part of this watch's legacy is its involvement with the moving image that actually goes back to the very infancy of motion picture technology. Santos Dumont became the first person ever to be filmed in flight in November 1906 when he flew for 21.5 seconds. Most astonishingly enough, and what we watch fans will find endlessly enthralling is that the Cartier that would go on to be named after him was actually on his wrist in that very moment. Fifth reason is very simple, versatility. Compared to the dressy sensibilities of the Cartier tank, the Santos is uh, more modern, more masculine as a result, and therefore, in my opinion, more versatile. When we look at the success of brands like Rolex, for example, one thing that makes their watches so compelling is the ability to work with different sartorial choices, and just as important, situational versatility as well. I adore my Submariners, Datejusts, Day Dates, GMT, Masters, and so on, as they can all be worn with quite literally anything. Either super casual in a tracksuit, or later that same day, suited and booted for an evening soiree or a night at the opera. Only true do-it-all watches can achieve this level of versatility and it's a rare occurrence trust me but when you find a watch like this it's it's wonderfully rewarding because you know it's adaptable to any situation but this has also given it a whole new lease of life and a whole new uh kind of success with a different younger generation today the watch is favored by music artists like new york city's seminal rapper naz or the Italian artist and renowned watch-slash-art collector Che Pequeno, the late great Pop Smoke from Brooklyn, or the Academy Award-winning actor and comedian Jamie Foxx. And of course, the previously discussed in a video back in 2019, the influential West London rapper now turned kick game franchise entrepreneur from London, Fredo. In many ways, the Santos now represents the up-and-coming self-made captains of industry, in comparison to the old money allure of the tank. What undoubtedly assists this is the wider variety to choose from over its five generations of evolution. The early versions being more traditional and the later generations being more modern. Take the Santos 100A DLC, for example. I myself have had a serious thing for its hybridization of old school Cartier design elements mixed with the youthful, macho, sporty look of the DLC. Ultimately, you guys know me, I'm a child of the 80s. Uh, I love my cinematic references, and um, so I went for this one. Let's roll the unboxing. Because this was bought from Japan, still the sweet spot, um, I think for this model, and when you see it, it'll make sense. 
I'm using Spyderco, the Made in Japan Spyderco. This is the civilian version with the serrated blade of, of course, like you see there, Spyderco. That special Japanese steel. Um, so that's the knife check. Right, let's get into it. That's the security seal there. So this has been authenticated by eBay's program, which I've talked about before. <laughs> Cartier Santos stainless steel and yellow gold. Drum roll, please. Da, 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 da. Oh, there it is, there it is, there it is. Oh, oh my God. Those bl thermally blued hands, it is a moon phase. This is a quartz, so I'm probably gonna get some hate for it. Oh, there's the cobblestone, but look how thin it is. Oh, the full bracelet, two-tone, with the um, Cartier logo and the clasp. Look at that, so this is from the 90s, mid-size, and I've got the full box and papers, and in here, there should be the pusher. Normally you don't get, get to see this, but this is for the pusher for, I forget the complication, because this is, this has a uh, pointed date and moon phase, beveling in the edges. Really good nick. Let's, let's pop it on the wrist. Let's zoom out, pop it on the wrist. Oh, look at that. For me, oh my God, that's perfect. Oh, look at that two-tone, look at that bezel. That is just, look at the curvature. It just hugs the wrist. Let's move the glove out of the way. Oh, that's perfect. Oh my God. The perfect Santos for me. The grab and go quartz, just perfect. Anyway, let's take it uh, back to the studio. My sixth and final reason why I chose the Santos and this particular model is value for money. As high-end iconic luxury watches like Royal Oaks, uh, pretty much every Rolex, uh, along with all the other predictable options from various Swiss brands continue to escalate in price, Cartier seems to be more realistic in terms of what you get, especially on the used market. There's no shortage of vintage offerings, more affordable quartz versions, and no queue to get a new one either. There are many things that define what it means to be a luxury watch, aside from the obvious physical materials used. Cartier, however, has all the boxes ticked. Heritage, brand recognition, iconic status, cultural impact, fame, a unique design all of its own, and perhaps the hardest to achieve, something of a personal family tradition, at a fraction of the price of Royal Oak, which quite frankly would not exist if there was no Santos, one can confidently say it is far better value, especially if you go new with their in-house movement-based offerings. So there we have it. Oh, absolutely over the moon. This is my dream Santos. Uh, I know there's going to be detractors saying, oh, it's quartz, blah, blah, blah. I don't care. It doesn't have a running seconds. I forget it's quartz. I love the moon phase. It's easy to set. You know, you wear it when you wear it, pick it up and it's, you don't have to set it. I love the fact it's two-tone, it's compatible with my signet ring and accessories, this kind of thing. Now, I'm not going to do the full review. There's a lot to talk about. There's already so many things I noticed about this watch that I'm dying to share with you. Amazing little clever bits of design. As this is mine, I'm gonna do the full review in a couple of months. I'm gonna really wear it, really enjoy it. So stay tuned for that. This today is just an unboxing and my reasons why I fell in love with the, the Santos. We should talk about how much I paid. I'm not gonna be vulgar and give precise figures. I'm just gonna say this. I paid 40% less uh, than I would on the used market here in the USA. I bought this from Japan, it's still a sweet spot. There are bargains to be found. Um, yes, it was a little bit nerve wracking dealing with the, um, uh, the customs, but in the end, it finally got here. And the fact that it came with the box with the little pusher thing, fantastic. Really, really happy with that as well. So stay tuned for the um, full review and some more suede straps. This is why I mentioned it in my um, wristwatch check from Holbens. These are the Fluco German made to try on this. Although I've got to say, I'm loving the bracelet, but I want to see what it's like on the straps. Um, I want to have fun with it. Definitely a strap monster. So I thought I went for the burgundy and the gray, the anthracite, my two favorite um, suede straps. I've 
already got them different sizes as you can see there we go let me know your favorite cartier in the comments and your favorite santos uh, is there any particular model or complication you like do you love cartier maybe you loathe cartier uh, share all that good stuff in the comments thank you so much for watching please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it found it useful and i will catch you in the next one okay ciao <laughs>